Microphone's working, good. All right. I had an adventure two weeks ago, I forgot to turn on the microphone. Um, and so I had the video, the video was silent, um, which maybe that was better for some people. Um, but, and then so I had to take the audio from the audio recording and match it up with the video from the video recording. And yeah, it was, it was an adventure, but we got it done. We got it done. And so, uh, so as we read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 22, and, and as we read this, I just actually, uh, this is something for the video. You guys can listen in if you want. Uh, just want to have a special welcome to uh, our church family up in Houston, B.C., who's watching the videos with us this morning, or watching this week anyway. So special welcome to you this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism... Which, now course, which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers being subject to him. This is the word of the living God. In 2008... Two brothers, Alex and Brett Harris, wrote a book that attempted to explode the myth of adolescence. We just started uh, listening to this book with our kids. Uh, it challenges teenagers to go beyond their comfort zone and to see their teenage years as not a vacation from responsibility, but as the launching pad for life. The book is called Do Hard Things. It was a, a New York Times bestseller. It's been a, a Christian bestseller for a long time. And it encourages Christians to rebel against the low expectations of culture by choosing to do just what the title says, by choosing to do hard things. And to do hard things for the glory of God. But the message is not just for teenagers. It's a good challenge for all of us. It's a, good, it's a good message for all of us not to succumb to the low expectations of culture, but to actually do hard things, to engage in hard things, to rise above the ordinary and rise above the average and to really challenge ourselves, to challenge ourselves to go deeper and to reach higher for the glory of God. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've been challenging you to do this. A few weeks ago, I challenged you to read Psalm 34 and then read it through every day and pick out the promises that they have there that God has for you for you. Last week, I asked you to, to write down what you would say to, to a friend who is in the hospital. And, uh, and I hope you wrote that down. I didn't have any volunteers, but, but I hope you wrote that down. I hope you took the time to do that challenge. And, and, uh, and if, you do, if you did do it and you do want to volunteer, get a hold of me and we'll share some next week. This week, I'll have another challenge for you to dig into, because I want to challenge you. I want to challenge us as a church to do hard things, to not stop at the ordinary, to not stop at the average, but to do hard things, to go above and beyond, to be like those, to be those weird Christians that actually believe what the Bible says, that actually do what God tells us to do, those hard things that God calls us to, and to actually know what the Bible says. Because it isn't enough just to talk about doing hard things. We've got to carry on and we've got to actually do hard things. We've got to make those hard choices. We've got to choose the things of God. Not because they're easy things, but because they're the right things. And too often in churches, we revert to what's easy. And we shy away from things that are hard. And, and we do that, we, we lower our expectations in order to either get people through the door or to keep them from running out the door. Whatever it looks like. So sometimes we lower our expectations too much. But what if we stopped? What if we stopped doing that? And what if we actually increased our expectations? What if we embraced the biblical teaching of holding ourselves and each other to higher expectations? Instead of shying away from hard things, what if we actually engaged in doing hard things? And held each other to higher standards. Not in a judgmental way, 
but an encouraging way where we continually are lifting each other up, continually growing, continually striving towards greater and greater maturity in the faith. What could we accomplish in this church? What could we accomplish in, in this village? What could we accomplish in our lives for the glory of God if we were to do that? And where would we start? Well, we might start here. We might start with these confusing and frankly weird verses that we read this morning. Because there's a temptation to skip the confusing verses. Right? We'll, ju we'll just skim over them. I don't really know what they mean, so we'll just skim past them. We'll read them really fast. And we'll just pretend they're not there. And then we'll kind of shove them over there. And somebody tell, oh, you know, they're, they're controversial, so we don't want to talk about them. Right? And, and so why don't we start here? Let's start here with this hard section of Scripture. Now, I've done a lot of reading this week. And, and if you remember a few weeks ago, I brought out a book that was called The Hard Sayings of the Bible. Well, this, this section of the Bible uh, has like four entries in The Hard Sayings of the Bible book because there's like one in every verse and so we're going to tackle some of it we're not we're not going to be able to tackle it in full because we just don't have the amount of time you can only pack so much into an hour and a half message <laughs> but we're actually going to tackle it and there's two dangers like i said with 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 the strange verses with the weird verses one is that one danger is just to ignore it Right? We're just going to ignore it. We don't really know what it means. It's kind of confusing, so we'll just set it aside and we're not going to worry about it. The other danger is to, is to make too much of it and, and make whole doctrines and, and whole churches and stuff on, on these confusing parts of Scripture. And so we want to stay away from those two dangers. But instead, we can look at these hard verses as, a, as an opportunity to recommit ourselves for studying the Word for what it is. So when we get to these hard passages, what we can do, instead of, instead of going to this danger and say, I just skip over it because I don't know it, or I'm going to make everything of it, we can say, well, I'm going to actually take this opportunity to recommit myself to reading what Scripture actually says and trying to understand it. I'm going to take this as a challenge, as an opportunity to do hard things. And, and, and we're going to, so we're going to study it, not for what we assume it says, and we're going to be careful not to study it for what we need it to say in order to fit into some theological system either, because that's a danger sometimes too. Where we have this system and we have this box and we say, well, everybody ha everything has to fit in this box, so this has to mean this in order to fit into this box. We want to be careful of doing that. And so we're going to do hard things this morning. We're going to tackle these verses head on. We're going to dig into them together. We're going to wrestle with them. And in them, what we're going to see is we're going to see the glory of Jesus Christ. First as an example for us in suffering, and then in His triumph over the forces of evil, and finally, in his authority over all things in creation. That's what we're going to find in these verses. And so why is this passage so confusing? Well, there's actually two main areas of difficulty in this passage, which we're going to get into in a second. The first, the first bit is relatively easy to understand. The beginning is relatively easy to understand. That Jesus suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And while this is relatively reasonably understandable, it's hugely significant. This is the example Peter is giving us for our own suffering. And Peter's just gone through two chapters of our own suffering and suffering in the world. And how, do we, how do we endure suffering in the world? How do we stand up under suffering? How do we deal with suffering in certain types of relationships? And, and then he points to Jesus as our example. He says, Jesus suffered for us. That since Jesus suffered for us, we can follow His path. And we can endure suffering for His sake. Since He endured suffering for our sake. And that Jesus' suffering, the purpose was to bring us to God. That was the purpose of Jesus' suffering. He didn't suffer just to suffer. But His suffering, the purpose of His suffering was to bring us to God. Because there was no other way we could be reconciled to God. There was no other way we could have our sins paid for. No other way we could be forgiven. No other way we could come to God except through Jesus and His sufferings. That sin could be punished. And sinners could be forgiven. So the one who justifies could also be just. And also, believe it or not, this section of Scripture, this verse here, is a highly significant, highly important verse in rightly understanding the Lord's Supper in communion. You might think, well, how does that fit? Well, how it fits is this. Because Christ suffered once and for all. 
when we take communion, we don't sacrifice Christ again and again and again every week, every time we take communion. We learned in our church history course about John Calvin this past week. And it was this verse, it was this section of Scripture and this verse specifically that really, for John Calvin, made the break for him for, for leaving the Roman Catholic Church. And the reason why it made the break for him is the Roman Catholic Church teaches um, that their view of Mass, their view of, of communion, is that it's a bloodless sacrifice. And that Jesus is offered up week after week after week to pay for the sins of the people. And John Calvin read this section of Scripture. He said, no, it says Jesus suffered once and for all. We don't continually sacrifice Him. And so this verse is also significant for communion. That Jesus is once and for all perfect offering of Himself. When He was put to death in the flesh was sufficient for all unrighteousness and for all who call upon His name to be cleansed and made righteous and given life in the Spirit just as Jesus was made alive in the Spirit. Now, of course, there's mysteries that abound in that too and things that we could dig into a lot more, but, but these are the teachings which we accept by faith and, and accept by reason as we employ our reason to understand them. But it's really verses 19 and 20 where we really get into the confusing stuff. And uh, there's one scholar that I, that I like to read, and uh, one of the things he says, and I think I've said it to you before, he says, if it's weird, it's important. Because it's in there for a reason, right? These guys didn't have a word count. They weren't trying to get to 500 words, right? You know when you're writing an essay and you want to try to get to 500 words, and so you start putting in just extra words just to fill the space? Or you write a whole bunch of like gibberish words at the end and then highlight them and change the font to white so they don't show up? And then it looks like you got like 500 words? I'm not condoning that, Hannah. Just, uh, just saying that some people might have done that. Um, I generally have the opposite problem, <laughs> cutting it down. But Peter didn't just stick these in here just because he was trying to fill the, the parchment. He was trying to fill the scroll. They're in there because they're important. And all Scripture is important. If they're weird, they're important. And there's so many questions. So verse 19 and 20, I'm just going to read them again. Uh, Jesus was made alive in the Spirit in which He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So many questions. So many questions. First of all, it said he went. Where did he go? Where did he go? And it said he, he proclaimed or he preached. What did he say? What did he proclaim? What did he preach? And it says he went and he proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Who are these spirits in prison? Who formerly did not obey in the days of Noah. So where did he go? What did he say? Who did he talk to? These are all questions that, that we have. I don't think these are questions that the original audience of Peter would have had, though. I think the people who Peter wrote to would have understood all those questions. They would have known what he was saying. Because Peter here is actually using a, 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 a metaphor. He's using a, a, an example of what Jesus did. And, and I think they would have picked it up. I think they would have known. And I'll explain why, why I think they would have known. So here's where we want to make sure that we're taking what the text says. Right? We want to be sure we're taking what the text says. Not what we think it said. Not what we assume it says. Not what we need it to say to fit into our system. But what does it actually say? And help us understand what it says. We want to know who Peter is writing to. Would they have understood? I, I said I think, they've, I think they would understand. I think they would understand what Peter was saying. Peter's writing to people living in the first century. He himself living in the first century. Peter is what you would call a second temple Jew. And a second temple Jew is somebody who is a Jewish or part of Judaism, living in the Second Temple period. The Second Temple period ran from about 600 B.C. to about 70 A.D. when it was destroyed. And so this is the Second Temple. So this is after the First Temple, Solomon's Temple, is destroyed. And then there's a Second Temple built. And so the Second Temple period runs from about 600, AD, or 600 B.C. to about 70 A.D. when it's destroyed by the Romans. 
And, and so knowing something about Second Temple Judaism and, th- and the thoughts and beliefs and the understanding of that time are going to help us to understand the text. About nine years ago, I went on a mission trip to Romania. And I preached in a little village uh, named San Cry. And a very small village. And so if you think of the village, every morning, in the morning, um, the... It, it wasn't a shepherd, because they weren't sheep, they were cows, but uh, the, the herder, the cow herder, would walk down the street, and he'd, he'd ring his bell, and as he walked down the street, he'd unclip the, the gates of each, each house. And as he unclipped the gates of each house, and they swung open, the cow from that house would come out and follow the herder down the street, and he would take them out to pasture. And that happened every morning. He'd walk down the street, and he'd clip the gates, and then the cows would all go out, and he'd take them out to pasture, and at the end of the day, he'd come back home, and, he'd, and the cows would fall and they would go off to their homes. Um, every, every, every house had a, a well in the front yard and had a chicken. Uh, we were getting woken up by a rooster at like 5 a.m. every morning. And so we kind of mentioned something about that. And that night we had chicken for dinner and it didn't happen again. <laughs> but I was there and I was preaching in this little church. In a very, very traditional church. Men on one side, women on the other. They all spoke Hungarian. And so I needed a translator. And I'd never preached with a translator before, but I preached with a translator. And I was speaking on sin. And I was using the illustration of the movie and the stage play, The Little Shop of Horrors. Is everybody familiar with The Little Shop of Horrors? Right? It was a movie with Rick Moranis, and there was a plant, right, that ate people, right? Uh, Steve Martin was the crazy dentist. Everybody? Yeah, good. And so I used that illustration. So we know about that illustration. And my illustration was the plant was never satisfied with the blood that he got, and he always needed more, right? He always needed more, you know, see more, I need more, you know, see more, see more. And, and he always needed more blood. And, and so I, my illustration was that, and that sin was like that. Sin always takes us further than we want to go, and it always wants more, it always demands more from us. And that was my illustration. It was a really, really good illustration. Unfortunately, I didn't put two and two together that maybe the people in the rural village in Romania weren't familiar with the Little Shop of Horrors, and that my translator wasn't familiar with the Little Shop of Horrors. And so my amazing illustration about the Little Shop of Horrors turned into the Little Shop of Horses. And nobody understood my illustration. And the translator was looking at me really strange because I was talking about the Little Shop of Horses, and I was talking about how the horse, how, how the plant always wanted more blood, and it was never enough, and everybody was staring, like I was already weird right? And then this was even weirder. And nobody understood my illustration. Nobody understood my point that I was trying to make because we weren't speaking the same language, literally and figuratively. So in a way, we need to speak Peter's language. We need to understand his point because he's also using an illustration to make his point. Peter's point here is that Jesus is victorious over his enemies. That he accomplishes victory over his enemies through suffering, and that this suffering leads to glorification. And let's unpack some of the particulars a little bit now. So let's start answering some of the questions. Where did Jesus go? It says he went. He went where? Well, that's answered in who he went to. So we're going to answer who, excuse me, who he went to first. He went to the spirits in prison. That's what it says. He went to the spirits in prison. This is verse 19. Well, the first thing we under- need to understand about this is when, when the Bible uses the word spirits like this, where it's just an unqualified just spirits, it's only ever used of spiritual beings. Spirits in this way, used in this way, is never used of people. It's only ever used of spiritual beings. So right away, we know that he's talking about spiritual beings. And this, this term is actually used quite a few times for angelic or supernatural beings. So it's not just a one-off time in Peter here, but it's used over and over in the Scriptures for angelic or supernatural beings. And so we need to... So first of all, there's our first thing. Who did he go to? He went to the spirits in prison. So these are spiritual beings. And that's, um, that's, that's lifted up by... It says that Jesus was died in the flesh and made alive in the Spirit in which he went to the spirits in prison. So in the Spirit, he's going to spirits. He's in a supernatural, spiritual place. Right? He's, he's Spirit. He's talking to spirits. 
And there are other suggestions out there of, of who these spirits are, but I think this is the best one. I'm con- actually, I'm convinced this is the best one. Um, and the best and most likely identification is that these are the spiritual beings that Peter describes in his next letter, in 2 Peter 2, 4. It says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. These are the spirits. I think Peter is talking about here. Jude 6, we have the same thing. The angels who did not stay within their position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So not only are these spirits, but they're rebellious spirits. They're spirits who have done something wrong. And they're in chains. They're in prison, what Peter says. And then we link this with the rest of the passage that Peter says. Peter says these, these rebellious spirits, these spirits who are in prison, who disobeyed in the time of Noah. Right? They disobeyed in the time of Noah. So what happened in the time of Noah? Where do we see spirits that disobeyed in the time of Noah? Well, we go back to Genesis 6 and we look at the time of Noah. And what do we see? We see sons of God who came down and procreated with the daughters of men and created the Nephilim. Genesis 6 says, when, a man began, when man began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. In the second temple period and in the New Testament, there's a long tradition that these fallen angels are kept in a prison. Right? Peter, Second Peter says that they're in chains of gloomy darkness. Jude 6 says that they're in eternal chains of gloomy darkness being kept until the judgment of the great day. So not only is Peter talking about spirits, but we've got spirits connected to Noah and connected to Noah and would have instantly brought his readers' minds to these specific spirits. This is the language Peter is speaking. He's speaking about these specific spirits. These specific imprisoned spirits. So that's where Jesus goes to. That's who he goes to talk to. This is the spirits in prison. The spirits that came and fell in Genesis 6, who rebelled in Genesis 6. So where does he go then? Where are they? Where does he go? It says he went. Where does he go? Well, he goes to the place where they're being held, which is described as, in a few different ways, described as hell, but more accurately maybe described as Tartarus or Sheol, the place of the dead, the place where they are held in gloomy chains of darkness. Peter goes, or Jesus goes there in the spirit because it's a spiritual place. And so he's got to go there to proclaim to them or to preach to them. Now, there's a lot more in that because you could talk about when does he go, right? We don't have time. I don't have time to get into that now, but um, maybe over a, a chicken wing or something at lunch. I'd be happy to explain it. Where does he go? He goes to hell or Tartarus or Sheol, the place of the dead, where the dead are being held, where the dead spirits are being held in gloomy chains of darkness. And what does he tell them? What is the, pro- what is the, the content of his proclamation? What is the content of his preaching? What's his sermon to these rebellious spirits that he goes? Well, when you look at verse 19, verse 19 where it says proclaiming or preaching, he went and he preached or proclaimed to the spirits, that doesn't equal that he proclaimed the gospel. See, preaching doesn't exactly mean the gospel. You can preach about all kinds of things. Right? What's the Madonna song? Papa, don't preach. You know, you can have people stop. Oh, you're so preachy. Stop preaching at me. Right? Doesn't necessarily mean you're sharing the gospel. So preaching doesn't mean gospel. Jesus wasn't sharing the gospel. And, and the word here, proclaim, is used to herald the king or the kingdom. Not necessarily to preach the good news. And we know this not to preach the good news because there's no conversion happening in this verse. It doesn't say he went to the spirits in prison and preached to them and they came out of there and they were saved. And you've got to think, if Jesus goes somewhere and preaches, people are going to get saved. Nobody gets saved. And so he's not preaching the gospel. What he's doing is he's proclaiming his victory and the spirit's defeat. He's going to this place where spirits, rebellious spirits, are held in gloomy chains of darkness and he is proclaiming his victory and their defeat. That they're not victorious. That just because he died, they did not win. That Jesus is not defeated 
That their judgment is sealed. And more than that, Jesus now holds the keys of death and Hades. He goes and He steals the keys of death and Hades. He goes and takes their lunch money. Right? And takes the keys of death and Hades. Now he, he controls death and Hades. He's come and He's taken them by defeating death. And Jesus won the war on the cross. He has won the war over evil on the cross. They lost. He won. There'll be no victory for evil. That's what He goes and proclaims. He goes and proclaims these rebellious spirits are being held to judgment. And He says, guess what guys? I know I died. But that's how I beat you. You didn't win. You're not going to win. You're never going to win. And I was always going to win. That's what he did. Why would Peter tell this story? What's the purpose of kind of just inserting this in here, even if his original audience knew what it was saying? What's the purpose of it? Well, what, Peter would, what Peter's doing, he was using a story that would be familiar with his audience to make a point. Just like I was doing with the little shop of horrors. The problem is, we aren't familiar with the story that he's using, just as the church in Romania wasn't familiar with the story I was using. Peter is actually using the story of Enoch. And if, if you know about Enoch, Enoch's mentioned a couple times in the Old Testament, right? Who knows what's Enoch famous for in the Old Testament? He's a seventh from Adam, and he's famous for what? Taken up for death. He doesn't die, right? He's one of the few that doesn't die. He's taken up. It says, Enoch walked with God, and then he was taken into heaven. A lot of tradition, a lot of... Um, um, stories grew up around the Enoch story. And, and these stories and, and it was, were put down in a book. They were written down in a book. And Second Temple period Judaism and Second Temple Judaism, there's a very, very popular book about Enoch. Anybody have an idea what the book was called? Enoch, yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's called the book of Enoch, first Enoch or second Enoch. And, and they have these stories about what Enoch did when he went to heaven. One of the things that Enoch did when he went to heaven is, um, well, in in Enoch, sorry, it describes in detail the sins of the sons of God in Genesis 6. So it really dives into what's going on in Genesis 6. Now, I'm not saying that Enoch is Scripture or should be Scripture or anything like that. What I'm saying is the people who are reading 1 Peter would have read the book of Enoch, and they would have known the book of Enoch. And so their thinking would have been colored by the book of Enoch. And in the book of Enoch, it explains Genesis 6 and what happens in Genesis 6 and all that. And one of the things that Enoch actually does is Enoch is actually sent to these spirits that are in prison. And the spirits ask him to go intercede to God. So Enoch goes to God and he says, can we let these guys out? They're sorry. And God says, no, we're not letting them out. Go back and tell them. And so Enoch goes back and tells them, no, we're not letting you out. Peter draws on that story. He touches on that story. He says, remember when Enoch did that? You guys know the story of Enoch. Remember when Enoch did that? Jesus does it. Jesus is the new and better Enoch. So Paul and Romans talk about how Jesus is the new and better Adam. And in 1 Peter here, Peter talks about how Jesus is the new and better Enoch. And Peter's audience would have known this. The reason why we don't pick up on it is because we don't know it. We haven't read 1 Enoch. We haven't read 2 Enoch. We're not steeped in that culture that this is what they would have believed. So Peter, Jesus is the new and better Enoch who actually takes the keys of Hades, Hades, who actually wins the war, who actually seals the judgment of the spirits who rebelled. So where does Jesus go? He goes to Sheol, Hades, Tartarus, hell, the place of the dead, the spiritual realm where the rebellious are held in chains of gloomy darkness until the judgment. And who does He speak to? He speaks to rebellious spirits that are there. And what does He proclaim? He proclaims that they have no hope. That he has won. That they have no hope of victory. And all they can do is wait until the final judgment until they're cast in the lake of fire. Jesus overcomes evil. They don't get a second chance. Evil doesn't get a second chance afterwards. But God wins. God triumphs. He triumphs through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter then builds on the story of Noah's Ark to talk about baptism, and it brings us to the other really difficult part of the passage, where it says that baptism saves us. Very clear in the script, baptism now saves us. This one's a little bit easier to decipher. Peter expands on the implications of Jesus' death and resurrection. 
And at some point, Jesus affirmed the condemnation of the fallen angels. And Peter then employs the analogy of the salvation of Noah and his family through water to describe the salvation of believers through baptism. So Noah, was Noah saved? Was he saved by the ark? In a way, he was, right? In a way, they were in the ark, and that saved them from dying in the flood. But what actually saved Noah was his faith in God. It was God who actually saved Noah. It was was Noah's faith in God that made him build the ark in the first place. So we could say Noah was saved by the ark, and that'd be true and right. But in a greater sense, Noah was saved by his faith. His faith in listening to God. We are saved by baptism, but in a truer sense, a greater sense, we are saved by faith in God. And that works itself out in baptism. Noah's faith in God worked itself out in building the ark. Our faith in God works itself out in baptism. And what's really, really interesting here, what I think is really interesting, maybe you don't think it's interesting, but um, you can preach the sermon next time. Uh, um, What I think is really interesting is that you get this, this symbol then in baptism where it's symbolic of act of faith. And then Peter emphasizes this by stating how baptism is an appeal to Christ's resurrection. It's not an appeal to a physical washing of the body, but it's an appeal to a clear conscience through the work of Jesus Christ. That Christ's resurrection has eternal implications for the divine beings that rebelled against God and eternal implications for us who have faith in God. And the resurrected Christ is now elevated to the right hand of God with authority over all angelic beings. With all of creation. Jesus has authority over all of creation. So what does baptism have to do with it? Well, baptism is actually a commemoration of the themes of Genesis 6. A commemoration of the themes of the flood. And this is what I mean by that. That during baptism, we play out the death and resurrection of Christ the saving of souls from an evil world, and at the same time we proclaim victory, excuse me, victory over evil. So it reflects the belief that Jesus is Lord. It signifies the judgment of sin and the subsequent salvation through the new life provided by the resurrection of Christ. Just as Noah and his family came through the floodwaters to a new life, so do believers come through baptism. It's not the baptism that saves, but it's the action of God that it signifies. And baptism is spiritual warfare. Every baptism is a reminder to the fallen angels that they lost. Every baptism is a reminder to the fallen angels that they lost. To evil that they lost and Jesus won. And we reenact Jesus' death and resurrection to show this. And this is why ancient baptismal rites, so baptismal rites or baptismal sayings or things like that in the early church, always included a renunciation of Satan and his angels. That before somebody was baptized, not only were they asked if they had faith in Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sins, but they were asked if they renounced Satan and his angels. Because baptism is an act of spiritual warfare. It's showing what side you're on. What side am I on? Am I on the side of Jesus who wins, or I'm on the side of the enemies of God. And baptism puts you squarely on the side of the enemies of God. Sorry, well, baptism puts you squarely on the side of Jesus who is victorious. And as we baptize people, we have this this spiritual warfare. This is another one coming to our side. Here's another one who's not with you anymore. Here's another one who's been saved out of the flood. The passage then ends, we'll end with this. With Peter once again emphasizing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is risen and he's at the right hand of God in heaven. He's on the throne. He's in authority over all creation. All angels, authorities, and powers in subject to him. Jesus commands everything. There's nothing that he is not in authority over. Nothing in all of creation. Nothing at all. Jesus wins he wins and he wins through suffering and he wins through his death he tramples over death by death 
Jesus descends to the earth and He suffers for the redemption of humans and He reverses and He defeats the rebellion and then He ascends to heaven and He takes us with Him. And He is seated in the place of authority. And so we need to remember both the humiliation, both the suffering of Jesus and the exaltation of Jesus because we share in both. We've talked a lot about suffering over the last few weeks and sometimes we can think, well, the Christian life is just a life of suffering. But it's not. It is a life of suffering, but it's also a life of victory. Because Jesus wins, that means we win. Those who are in Jesus win. They win the victory because Jesus won the victory. Our hope is sure. See, we share in both the humiliation and the triumph of Christ, and that's both symbolized in baptism. Our hope is grounded in the resurrection of Jesus because Christ has risen. With Him we're victorious. He has overcome the world. He's trampled the death. He holds the keys. He is the King. He sits on the throne. He is the triumphant King. This passage starts as Jesus the exemplary sufferer and ends as Jesus the triumphant King over all things. And in the middle it talks about Jesus' defeat of evil. So what's our overall message? Jesus is victorious, and those who are in Him will also be victorious. This is our overall message of the passage. And so because Jesus has overcome, we can do hard things without fear. We can do hard things without worrying, because the war has been won. Even if we lose the battle, we know that Jesus has won the war. We know that He is victorious, and if we're with Him, we will be victorious victorious we can do hard things we can endure suffering because he suffered for us we can push away low expectations and we can go deeper and we can reach higher for the things of God we can dig into the scriptures and we can understand them we can do the hard work of really understanding them and knowing God through them so this is my challenge for you this week what hard thing is standing before you right now What hard thing is in your life right now that's standing before you that you need to tackle? Maybe you got a a hard task in your life that you need to deal with. Maybe there's a hard change that needs to happen and you've been avoiding it. Maybe, Maybe because you're afraid of it. Change is hard. Hard things are hard. Maybe you need to have a hard conversation with somebody. Maybe you've been avoiding picking up the phone and having a hard conversation. Maybe you need to start a habit or stop a habit. And that's hard. Maybe God is sharing you, calling you to share the gospel with somebody. Maybe God is calling you to step into a ministry. Maybe God is calling you to volunteer. For something. What's the hard thing that God is bringing to your mind right now? What's the hard thing that you can tackle this week? I want to challenge you. Jesus has won. He is victorious. He has risen from the grave. He has defeated the forces of evil. He wins. And we're with Him. And so we win. And so we can do hard things. Step up. Step out. Knowing that you are His. And knowing that means you win. Let's pray. Father, Lord, there is there's, there's so much in your word, in each verse of your word. There's so many jewels in each place that we can't excavate all of them, but the few that you've allowed us to bring out today, I pray that you would help us to uh, assimilate those into our lives. Help us to understand you in greater ways and better ways. Lord, help us to grab hold of that teaching and believe and act upon it that you have won. I pray that you would bring the hard things 
to mind the thing that we need to do, and then you would give us the courage to step out and do it. That through the Spirit, you would work in us and through us. God, that that the preaching of your word would be effective this morning. And Lord, we would be made more mature. We would be made more loving, more humble, more bold by your spirit and by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite uh, Jim and I'll invite Doug up and uh, we will take communion.